yeah, thank you everybody for being here. Thank you, Paulo, for being here. Um, Paulo is a product manager at FanRock, an e-commerce startup based out of San Francisco and Houston. Um, in his role, he's responsible for customer acquisition of FanRock's direct-to-consumer shops through website design, advertising, and product testing. Uh, his role spans working with engineering, design, operations, and manufacturing vendors. Prior to his current role, he led design as FanRock's art director. Um, he started with FanRock as the co-founder's first hire, a graphic designer. Uh, Paulo has a BA in media studies from the University of California, Berkeley. On the weekends, catch him at Sydney Cafe with his r wife, running with his dog, or reading a good book. Uh -huh. Yeah, Paulo, thanks for being here again. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you. And I'm thinking that I'm going to cut off my video and my microphone and um, I'll allow you to introduce yourself as well and uh, start the presentation. Oh, it sounds like your microphone is muted. Oh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. And um, can you allow me to share my screen, please? Oh, yes. Um, let me see. So I'm going to make you a co-host. All right, should be able to. All right, here we go. All right, can you see that? Mm -hmm. Looks great. Okay. All right, well, great. Thank you for that introduction, Koya, and um, good morning, everyone. Today, we're going to be talking about conversion rate optimization and ways that you can set up your e-commerce store for success on the Shopify platform. We're going to cover a range of topics today, uh, including why e-commerce matters for entrepreneurs, why Shopify is worth considering as your platform, designing your site for different customer segments, and designing experiences for customers on their journey to discovering your product. We have a lot of ground to cover because conversion rate optimization is a complex topic. Customers are different and products are different. What works for some people may not work for others. My goal today is to give you a framework for thinking about ways that you can improve your conversion rates. The first question we have to ask ourselves is, why e-commerce? What does it have to offer? Why is it worth considering for your business? There are three reasons that I want to share. The first is that e-commerce is an own channel. Own channels give you greater control over the customer experience with your product. You get to determine all of your customers' touch points as they engage with your product and your brand. So let's go with a real world example, Apple. Their decision to create their own brick and mortar showrooms allowed them to create a space of luxury and openness that invites users to explore their products. They're able to curate the context around buying their product in a way that aligns with their brand. But this is a real world example. Let's now look at a digital example of a more traditional retail experience. This is walmart.com. And today we're shopping for deodorant. When you're, stock, when you're stocked in a retail store or site, you're fighting for visibility against other brands for that customer's attention. This page shows you an example of the search results that you get on walmart.com. When you search for deodorant for men, there are many choices to choose from without a clear winner for someone who doesn't already have a relationship with one of these brands. In contrast, let's look at direct-to-consumer brand Native. Native is an e-commerce brand that sold to Procter & Gamble in 2017 for $100 million. They went the e-commerce route and they've curated a very different experience of purchasing than what you see on walmart.com. When you browse the deodorant collection, you're not actually taken to a grid of items, but to a very focused page. So even though Native has many deodorant SKUs, you're not presented with the experience of having too many different things to choose from. Because this is Native Store, they can design this experience however they like. So they focus on showing the deodorant prominently, and then they give you the options of different um, scents that you can choose from. The second reason to consider e-commerce is that it yields higher margins for merchants. The simplified formula for, mar for margin is revenue minus the cost of goods sold minus a whole bunch of other expenses, of which there are many. You have your advertising, your fulfillment logistics, your taxes, 
and wholesale discounts to get in places like Walmart. But when you go the e-commerce route, you're able to cut out all these wholesale discounting costs by removing these middlemen and you get to keep that extra margin for yourself. The third reason that to consider the e-commerce route is just that there are lower barriers to entry for new entrepreneurs to get started. With traditional retail, you have to negotiate contracts with places like Walmart. These contracts might have a higher order minimums and a commitment to moving larger quantities of inventory over a period of time. And because you have to work with these external vendors, it may take longer to get useful results about your sales, which you can then act upon. But in contrast, with a direct-to-consumer e-commerce store of your own, you have a lot more independence and flexibility to evolve your business. There are lower upfront investments in terms of inventory and operating costs, and with some businesses, no inventory is needed at all. And because it's your shop, you have a faster feedback loop because you can access your data directly on a daily basis. You can identify trends for managing your business effectively, and these faster feedback loops ultimately lead to more, inter in more iterations, more learnings, and faster growth. So if you're convinced that e-commerce is actually worth considering, then the next question we have to ask ourselves is, why Shopify? Why not Squarespace or Wix, BigCommerce, Magento, WooCommerce, or even Amazon, or any of the other e-commerce platforms that you may have heard about out there? And um, let me start off by saying that I believe Shopify is leading the e-commerce boom by a mile. This is a graph of Google Trends data pulled earlier this week, which looks at e-commerce trending over the last five years. E-commerce, which is the line in blue, has held pretty consistently over the past five years. And that's because e-commerce itself is, as a concept, is not new. The dot-com boom of the, early, of the late 90s yielded many e-commerce businesses, not all of which were successful. But those businesses didn't have e-commerce platforms like Shopify to help them run. Shopify which is the line in red, has been on a steady rise, while some of their other competitors have been comparatively flat over the same period of time. And you can see on the far on the right side of the graph a big spike, which is around the time that the coronavirus lockdowns began. And this is people turning to Shopify as an alternative once um, to run businesses. But why? One thing that Shopify does really well is they make it really easy for entrepreneurs to get started. They have a really simple, low code, no code, what you see is what you get interface where you can literally get set up in minutes. What's on the screen is a quick video of me setting up a new Shopify store with a photo of a dog because this, do this store will be for dog toys and treats. The design of the site is ready out the gate and you just have to pop in the content that you want to display on your site. And speaking from personal experience, having built more than five stores for FanRock and freelancing for other businesses, transitioning to e-commerce and even building a store of my own. I can tell you that Shopify is just extremely easy and intuitive to use. The next thing Shopify has going for it is a robust ecosystem of apps. So while Shopify provides this platform to conduct your business, it is supported by dozens of apps and themes that provide additional optimizations to further augment your store. You have apps that help you with your email capture and marketing automation, customer review apps that automate the sourcing of your reviews from your customers. Apps that run referral programs that automatically create discounts for your customers to share with their friends. You can have shipping providers that take care of managing your inventory and fulfillment logistics for your orders. And there are messenger apps that extend the conversation beyond email into other channels like Facebook Messenger. And there are also print-on-demand print providers which reduce the overhead to create apparel and other printed goods. So you can take an idea and create it instantly without having to worry about how a shirt actually gets made. And there are even apps that record anonymized videos of a customer's activity on your site so that you can see what they're clicking on, where they're scrolling, and can even display an exit intent survey to solicit feedback about your store, like a personal concierge that's asking them some questions on the way out. And I'll talk more about this later. Ultimately, these apps are all designed to do, are each all designed to do one thing really well, which is to streamline your store operations and free you up to focus on building your product and growing your business. The third thing that Shopify does really well is supports for its merchants. They have helpful agents available 24 seven for fielding, fielding answers and helping you unblock issues result, uh, around your store. On the right side of this screen, it's just an example of how granular their support topics can get. 
covers base everything you can think of. Shopify also encourages their community of merchants and Shopify partners to be active in their forums to share really specific learnings that they have from growing their own stores so you can take it and apply it to your own to your store. The CEO of Shopify, Tobias Lucky, is even quoted as saying that Shopify has Shopify has been about empowering merchants since it was founded. And Shopify has always prioritized long-term value over short-term revenue opportunities. So at Shopify, the merchants and entrepreneurs come first, and their success is contingent upon your success on their platform. And so this is why I think the, rem the remainder of this talk will be around discussing e-commerce conversion optimization on Shopify specifically. Now, let's jump into understanding our conversion rates. But the first step to understanding your conversion rates is having a proper understanding of your customer segments. When you understand the different segments of your customers, you have an insight into their psychology. You know what's important to them. And with that, you can design your store to provide these customers with the thing that they need to convert. So we back into this segmentation by asking ourselves, why would people buy my product? Some customers are price motivated. They love a good discount or bundled savings. Other customers are attracted to the shiny new object, something that they've never seen before and they want to have. And other customers are just sold on the marketing vision of your, how your product can improve their lives. And it's worth noting that these three are not mutually exclusive. Customers can be motivated by each of these things to varying degrees. The next question we ask ourselves is, how is my product positioned? How is it presented on my store? What about the way that you've designed your site will make your product appeal to these different segments of customers? And to answer this question, let's think about our products on a spectrum between being an impulse purchase or a high consideration purchase. This concept is nothing new in the intersection of marketing and psychology. I was reading an interesting study published in the Journal of Academy of Marketing and Sciences which takes a look at three sets of factors that are key to driving impulse purchasing behavior. The first factor is an individual's own impulsiveness. This is something that is unique to people. You can't control this in others, but you can make it as easy as possible for visitors to your site to yield to their impulses. The second set of factors are utilitarian and hedonic benefits. So in other words, a product's functionality and its ability to bring happiness. They are equally impactful on influencing whether an item is viewed as an impulse purchase. And the third and strongest set of factors are marketing and pricing. Marketing communicates the features and ability to bring happiness, to increase the value that this product brings to people, whereas pricing sets the threshold where a customer will exchange their money for the perceived value of your product. But this is all pretty academic. What does impulse buying behavior actually look like in the wild? Luckily, Shopify provides interesting data points about your customers, which, which can help you answer where you fit on this spectrum. When a customer purchases in Shopify, they will tell you how many times this customer visited your store before they made that purchase. When your products have strong appeal as an impulse purchase, you're more likely to see that customers have only visited your, your site one time before they purchase. They purchased on the first visit higher consideration products, those customers tend to purchase after two or more visits. They didn't, they didn't find everything they needed on that first try, but eventually they came around and they were willing to spend. But in my experience of managing the operations of the source with an average order value of around $50, $50 is what I found seems to be the threshold for a majority of people to make that one store visit purchase or an impulse purchase. So, now what does designing for an impulse purchase actually look like? We're gonna take a look at some examples, all of which are on Shopify. And right now, right now we'll do what is essentially a website teardown, an exercise that is common in the e-commerce space and that involves browsing someone else's site and identifying the various mechanics that they're using to merchandise their products to people. So this is Fashion Nova. They're a relative newcomer powerhouse in the fashion world. They've got reported revenue of $400 million in 2019 built off of an unmatched influencer strategy. 
Cardi B and the, and the Kardashians are among their top partners. As a fast fashion brand, they move thousands of low cost items, but they also take steps to showcase frequent discounts, which further lower the price to accessing their products. Across their site, they feature a banner highlighting a discount code for 25% off. And right above the product title, they feature that same discount code, thereby increasing the chance of discovery and utilization by the people that are coming to their site. Another brand that we're gonna look at is Kylie Cosmetics. This is the makeup line of Kylie Jenner, also of Kardashian fame. This, this brand was valued at over a billion dollars. And earlier this year, Kylie sold a controlling stake of 51% for $600 million. Beyond the hype that is already generated by this brand through Kylie's own channels on social media, the store's emphasis on the reviews right below the product title adds a level of trust and social proof to this product. And the trending product animation on the top right of that photo, right next to the title, continues to build hype around this product. This increases the perceived value of their products and then the likelihood of a prospective customer to purchase because they don't want to miss out. The third store we're going to look at is Gymshark. This is a store on Shopify that has recently secured a round of funding that values them at $1.3 billion. Their products are premium athletic apparel, which they reframe as accessible using buy now, pay later options. These buy now, pay later options lower the perceived cost of these products by reframing a $60 pair of leggings as four payments of $15, and these are interest-free payments. So the product becomes much more accessible for people. This buy now, pay later mechanic doesn't just apply for low-cost items or for impulse purchases, but I wanna showcase it here because it's just one way that you can nudge a prospective customer into considering something as an impulse purchase, even if the price tag is on the higher end. So these are just some of the ways you can design your site to create the context for an impulse purchase by appealing to pricing and value. We have the buy now, pay later options, the promoting deals, building hype, and reviews. For products that are higher cost and value, customers may need more information to be convinced of their purchase. The next examples are all priced above $75. And while this $60 to $75 range is not an exact numerical divide, this higher price range sets the stage for the next ways that you can design for various customer segments. So we're going to show, talk about a brand called Manscaped. They're a men's grooming company that appeared on Shark Tank in October of 2018. They got funded $500,000 by Lori and Mark at a $2 million valuation. And this is their entry product bundle priced at $90. They prominently feature a 30-day guarantee that helps establish trust and reduces the risk of spending $90 on men's grooming products, which sounds like a lot. They break down the bundle so you can see what you're getting. You're getting the trimmer, the deodorant, the toner, and the shaving mat. So $90 for all these items with a guarantee suddenly doesn't make this purchase seem quite as expensive or quite as risky. The next e-commerce brand we'll look at is SodaStream. PepsiCo acquired SodaStream in 2018 for $3.2 billion. And this is their entry product set at $89. Like Manscaped, they also feature a bundle. First, this entire variant option is designed to display all of the items that are included in this bundle uh, into this $89 option. They've created a really large button, which creates a large click target, and it highlights the contents of this bundle prominently. So you're, you're getting the water maker, the carbonating cylinder, a one liter bottle, and free shipping and a three-year warranty all rolled up into that $90. But for another 40-ish dollars right next to it, you can get the hydration pack. And with that, you get everything, plus another two one-liter bottles, another two half-liter bottles, and a pack of lemon fruit drops. And so not only are they using bundling, but they're using a uh, well-placed upsell to help get people to go from the $90 option up to the $130 option. Further down on their page, they're providing even more context about their product. In this case, it's a demo of the steps that you need to follow on how to use it. And this is important because it addresses the customer concern about how they would actually use a product like this. How big is it? 
and um, how, how, without having to actually find a real soda stream to look at. And they're also doing a good job of reiterating, of re reiterating objective value propositions to help build trust and remove the risk from purchasing. So you have your free shipping, which lowers the perceived cost and increases the value of what you're getting. You're quantifying how many liters of drink you're actually purchasing. You're underscoring their warranty. And if something goes wrong, they've got great customer service that you can take advantage of. So overall, it becomes a valuable, low risk um, purchase to make. Another brand we'll look at is Allbirds. Last month, Allbirds raised $100 million on a $1.7 billion valuation. And they sell a premium price sneaker, which is in line with the 100 plus that you can expect to shell out for Nike or Adidas sneakers. To make up for the online experience, they're providing many high quality photos of the shoes from a bunch of different views. And you can't see it here, but in that bottom left picture is actually a video of this person walking into the frame, stepping around the, the, with their shoes on, showing it at a bunch of different angles. So you can really see what the shoe looks like on somebody. And they're also featuring right below their add to cart button, uh, free, uh, free shipping benefit and their 30 day return policy. The free shipping adds value and the 30 day policy reduces the risk. Followed by three key features of this product, the quality of the materials, the support of the sole and the performance. They also curate a lookbook that further elaborates on each of the functional benefits of the shoe. This is a long, uh, this is a long stream with lots of pictures and information, which gives shoppers a familiarity with every inch of the shoe, as if they were holding it in their hands and turning it around to look at it from a bunch of different angles up close. Next brand we're looking at is Brooklinen. And they started off 2020 by raising another round of $50 million. This is the product page for their $435 cheap bundle. They create value by framing the sheets as a custom uh, purchase that's tailored to you. They also create a sense of urgency using a countdown timer on their discount. So they have this banner, which shows the time dwindling down for you to use your discount. Merchants using disc, uh, discount timers like this have reported seeing two to three X conversion rates improvements just from creating urgency. They also have, Brooklinen also has asset, the asset of tens of thousands of positive customer reviews, which they also feature uh, prominently at the top of their page. So this adds a lot of social proof for their uh, pretty expensive product. And like our previous examples, they use the lower portions of their page to further highlight the features of their products with close-up photography to spotlight details that you might not even notice if you were looking at this product in person. So to summarize, there are different web design tactics that you can use to nudge people closer to purchasing your product. You can increase the perceived value for the customer by offering first-time customers or loyal customers discounts. You can bundle savings or offer volume discounts for people who are willing to purchase more. You can throw in a freebie or whether it's shipping or some type of ancillary product that goes with the things that they're trying to get. And you can also highlight the benefits and value of your product by spotlighting your technical specifications, the product features, the materials, the craftsmanship, and you can create hype and urgency around your products to increase the perceived value of these products. And establishing trust with reviews from customers and a warranty shows that you stand by your product. So where you find yourself following along this spectrum will impact the strategies that you focus more of your energy on to improve your conversion rates. And what works for some people may not work for others, which is why it's a good practice to test each of these. And for testing, I would recommend a product like Google Optimize. So you can actually A-B test the effects of deploying different tactics. Since impulsiveness is unique to each person, not every person will have an inclination to be an impulse purchaser, no matter how expensive a product may be or how affordable a product may be. But any product has the potential to be an impulse purchase. If you can design your site to show off the utility, the, fun the functional benefits, and the emotional benefits of owning your product while positioning it as a great value for the price that the customer is being asked to pay. Now let's take a step back from talking about your conversion rates on your product pages and let's look at the overall customer journey. A common mistake that people make is this misconception that 
simply building a store will unlock sales. And this is a misconception because it takes a very narrow view of what a customer journey actually looks like. It only models a very intentional buying process where somebody knows what they want and they need a place to buy it. But in reality, customers take a journey to discover your product or site. Then when they browse and learn more, they may be convinced that what you have is what they need and they will hopefully purchase. But said another way, your product has to not only be the thing that a customer needs, but you also have to be in their mind at the right time to generate those sales. But what is the right time to be in front of a customer? And the answer is that it depends on where they are in their journey. On my screen is the uh, McKinsey customer journey chart. And I'd recommend reading McKinsey's article about the customer journey for extra context on a prospective customer's relationship with your brand. But the TL TLDR on that is that there are many steps that people take when they're trying to decide whether or not they want to purchase. And unlike a funnel view, which starts with many people and ends with a few, in the customer journey loop, everyone pro proceeds at their own pace. The journey loop helps visualize that long stretch between the initial consideration and the moment of purchase. And where your brand can create multiple touch points along that and interactions that help nudge a customer closer towards purchasing. <clears throat> so we ask ourselves, where does that journey begin? How is our product or site even being discovered? We keep coming back to this idea that different customer segments need different things to help them complete their purchase. And prospects discovering your brand through different methods will begin the relationship with your brand with different priorities and goals. They bring their own context when they begin your relationship with them, and so they're gonna need different things from you. Various methods of discovery mean that not everyone is present, or that not everyone is coming in through the front page of your site. Referrals can be word of mouth or social media links that do take people through your homepage, but people will, can also find you through ads, which can take them to any page, like product pages or landing pages. And people can find you through your search engines, which could land them on blog posts, your about page, or other information-rich pages on your site. So let's take a look at what this actually looks like for medical scrub company Figs. They raised their Series B in 2018 um, of around $65 million. And there are multiple ways that people can discover Figs. I'm telling you about it, so this is kind of like a referral. And referrals are most likely going to take you to your homepage. This commonly looks like a brand story that's shared in casual conversation. So if a friend was searching for a site and they wanted to know about um, scrubs and you happen to be somebody that wears scrubs and you told them how comfortable and soft your scrubs were, they might then search for it and they'll find the Figs homepage. The Figs homepage is, the homepage is actually entry point, is where people typically envision their customers arriving to their stores which is why it's a good place to give a top level overview about what your shop is about, what you sell, and even what your values and what your brand stands for. But the, the thing is, it's not the only doorway people are entering your site through, and it's probably not even the most common one. When people discover your site through ads, think about the context of an ad. Ads interrupt people that are going about their daily scrolling, scrolling with a thumb-stopping piece of content. Like testing different conversion mechanics on your site, you'll have to test different ad creatives since what captures one person's attention may be a dud for someone else. Your ads will take people to whichever page you sponsor and the most common, most common ones being product pages or landing pages, but you can set anything. It can be a collection page, it can be a about page, it can be something that advertises a very specific deal or something very seasonal. Discovery through search, begins with a customer that has a question. They're gonna to take to the internet with their query and designing your site for search helps your product show up as the answer to those questions. So by creating informative pages, you can help position your site as the answer to queries that in Figs's case might be, what are the best scrubs or what is the best scrub material? This landing page describes an innovative fabric technology that Figs uses in their products and it educates the customer about a new product they may not have known about. So having good content and pages that educate your customers will help boost your SEO and in increase the likelihood that your content and your products are shared with other prospective customers. 
people that discover you through search may not necessarily be ready to purchase right now, but now you're going to be at the top of their mind when they are thinking about something that is related to their search. Now, after a customer arrives to your site, by whichever entry point they've taken, the next question to ask is what are they actually doing on your site? They might browse, they might add products to their cart, they might buy products, or they might just leave. If they purchase right away, then they proceed through your funnel and into the segment of your, of your audience that has already placed a purchase with you. And if you remember from the McKinsey loop, the customer journey doesn't actually end at the, at the transaction. You have to think of the experience of just receiving an exciting product. There's so much more that happens after you give your money over. And I'll talk more in a little bit about that in a bit. The last conversion rates on Shopify can average around two to three percent, which means that the other 95% of people are abandoning your site without making a purchase. Regardless of whether they make a purchase or not, their behavior on your site is how you're going to be able to sort them into retargeting segments. Different people do different things depending on how ready they are in their journey to make a purchase with you. So then the question is, how do we track? Okay. With Shopify, you can track customer behavior using a combination of tools. Uh, I'm going to focus on Google Analytics, Facebook pixel tracking using Facebook for Business, Shopify's native tracking, and Hotjar. With Google, Google Analytics gives you a rich detailed view into the actual journey that people are taking on your site. You can see what pages they most commonly started with and then what pages they went to next and next and next. And so armed with this knowledge, you'll have a better idea of where to focus your efforts on to create a first, great first impression. You'll remember that I said that the homepage may not even be the most common starting point for your brand. And Google Analytics can help you figure out what that most common starting point is. Facebook for Business is a tool that tracks specific actions or events that are on your site, and it links that with the uh, social media profiles of people on Facebook and LinkedIn. So armed with this knowledge, you can take the, you can create personalized ads that address people's needs and interests based on the actions that they've taken to your site, whether it's visiting a specific page, adding a product to your cart, starting to check out and, but not doing it, or even people that have already checked, uh, purchased and you want to sell them more things. I'm also a fan of Shopify's native reports. Their dashboard gives you a good look at your overall conversion funnel with breakdowns by products and the channels that are driving traffic to your site. And then Hotjar is a tool that allows you to visualize the data of how people are behaving on specific pages on your site. They have hotspots that track page clicks, so you can see what, what parts of your page people are most engaged with. You can track people's mouse scroll paths the percentage of the page that they've scrolled so you understand, especially on those longer pages that we talked about, how far down people are actually getting. And I mentioned earlier that they have a feature that services an exit intent pop-up that allows you to actually ask people for feedback about what might be preventing them from purchasing today. So armed with data, you can make better decisions about what to do next with each of your segments to further optimize your conversion rates. But what about the customers that have already purchased? They need some love too. And the reason why is that existing customers are the cheapest customers to reacquire. You've already got their money. So now all you need to do is deliver on their customer expectations, everything that you've sold them on up to this point. E-commerce continues beyond your online store. You send them that confirmation email with information about when they can expect their product. You deliver that product in a timely manner to double down on their initial excitement that, of getting your product. And you can create a beautiful unboxing experience that makes them feel like they're opening a gift to themselves. And if it's something that they're really jazzed about, they might record it and you can share it with other people. Each of these touch points, each of these touch points is an opportunity to surprise and delight in a way that makes people more likely to come back to your store and convert again and tell other people about your product. Happy customers have the highest conversion rates and personal references are some of the greatest social proof you can acquire. But what about the 97% of people that didn't convert? Sometimes people just aren't ready for, to purchase for a variety of reasons. Some are looking for a better value. 
you can offer them a discount or a free item if they spend more than some amount of money. Other people just need more information about your products. And so you can retarget them uh, with educational content about your product, the problem it solves, or just how your product might be used in life. And maybe you just need better timing. Sometimes it's just not the right time. People are, are browsing your site and they get interrupted all the time, especially when they're on their phones while they're out and about. Because you know, two thirds of your website traffic is gonna be mobile. So maybe it was just, just wasn't the right time. Maybe you got to them too early and they just were not ready to make a purchase right now. And you just need to hit them with a reminder that you have this thing that solves this problem for them. And like being an impulse purchase versus a high consideration item, a customer can be swayed by all of these things to different degrees. Again, everyone is different. They need different things. But how do we actually retarget? One, the first way is email. And we're gonna look at how Pure Vita bracelets collects emails for retargeting. Pure Vita is a lifestyle jewelry company. In 2019, they sold to Vera Bradley for $130 million. They collect emails using a gamified email collection modal. What, the, what this does is it basically, it offers you the chance to get a free bracelet or a 10% discount. You click the button to spin, you get your result, and then in order to claim your prize, you have to give them your email. Just adding this uh, element of gamification already increases the uh, email collection rate. But with email collection, you also have to have good timing. Nobody wants to be bombarded as they're entering a store by some guy with a clipboard asking for their email, so why would you do this to them? on their online store. You want to give them a chance to show that they're engaged with what you have to offer before you ask them something. So you can use a heuristic that indicates engagement with your store to qualify potential leads for email collection. Uh, different things that you can use is time spent on the store or even the percentage of the page scrolled because this shows that people are actually uh, exploring and trying to find out more information. So they're much more likely to be someone that's willing to, at the very least, give you their email if not purchase from you outright. And once you have this long list of emails, that's when you can start promoting uh, your products. You can send event-based emails based off of, again, what people are doing on your site. So that way the emails are contextualized to what pages they've already seen. And if people have started to check out, but you know, stop for whatever reason, you can send them a follow-up email that um, offers them a discount or just reminds them of the thing that they needed to buy. And all this, of course, is in, in, in addition to the standard confirmation email so you can send. And the other way that we can reach target is ads. So, I mean, how, I mean, have you ever gone to a website and browse one thing and then immediately after you start seeing these ads for that product everywhere? I mean, this, this happens to me all the time. And this is done using the Facebook pixel, uh, pixel, which is easily injected into a Shopify store. You just copy it from your Facebook business manager and you paste it into your Shopify settings and it just starts working. This pixel automatically tracks the customer behavior so that you can target based on the actions that they've taken. So then you can advertise them a dynamic catalog ad which just shows them not only the product that they looked at, but if there are any other products in your site that Facebook thinks is a good fit, it's gonna show them those too. And you can also create audiences based on these on-site event groups. So the people that purchase, that's just one audience, but you can also do an audience of people that have added to cart, people that have viewed your pages on your store, people that have viewed multiple pages on your store as different proxies for engagement and readiness to purchase. You can appeal, you can, you can use that context to create Facebook creatives that appeal to different uh, things that might sway them to purchase, whether it's highlighting the functional, ben functional benefits of their products, the emotional benefits, the lifestyle benefits, and how this will make their life better, and, and or just appealing to people who are price sensitive by you know, sh sharing them a discount. So what we'll have on the screen are just some ads by a few e-commerce shops on Shopify. The first is uh, a video ad by Nugs. They've raised $4.1 million, and they're showing mouth-watering details of their soy nuggets. That's the one on the left. In the middle is a carousel ad by Bombas, a sock company which raised $15 million back in 2015, which displays a carousel that highlights the range of their product catalog and the features of their socks. And then on the right is just a static image by Death Wish Coffee, which has, they booked the $13 million in revenue in 2019. And it's just a lifestyle image showing their product in the context that 
a user is most likely to actually experience it, which is drinking that coffee out of a cup. So I'd like to leave you with some food for thought. The first is that this theme that different customers need and are motivated by different things. And different motivations can coexist. So it's a really good practice to think about your site design from multiple perspectives, be able to offer different things to different people. Second thing is that getting to people to convert is the product of the design of your site and the right nudges that are gonna get them closer to converting. Finding ways to emphasize the functional and emotional benefits of your product, uh, emotional benefits of owning your product at a fair price. Not every tactic works for every person. And what works for some sites may not work for others. Trust me, I've learned this in the process of building multiple sites. But multiple conversion tactics can coexist on your site. And as long as they're serving a need of your customers. Getting the conversion though comes from being in the right place at the right time for your customer's journey. So it's up to you to stay on top of mind with retargeting content that continues to add value and nudges them to visualize what their life could look like with your product. The third thing is to use the actual behavior of your customers to sharpen your own intuition about why your product works and what doesn't work and what can be improved. As the entrepreneur, you have the intuition about your business and the data will help you improve your conversion rates and grow it. But you have to examine that data. You have to formulate a hypothesis and validate it to get your business there. Remember that the data paired with your intuition will always outperform either of those two working on their own. So like I said, conversion rate optimization is a very complex topic because humans are complex creatures. By having a better understanding of your customer's mindset and the context that they're bringing to the table, you can design a better experience for them. By anticipating their needs, you can make them more likely to convert on your site. And building this picture of your customers isn't easy, and it should be an evolving process. I hope you guys have learned something today. If there's anything that you'd like to know more about, or if you think there's something that I'm missing, let's chat about it. You can get in touch with me on Twitter, at Palsolsky, or on LinkedIn, as Paolo Via Carlos. So thank you all for listening. Um, I think we have a few minutes for questions. Questions? Paulo, thank you so much uh, for the presentation. And yeah, let's open up to questions. If anybody has any, please feel free to throw them in the Q&A or the chat. Um, I actually had one of my own um, that I think could start us off here. Um, yes. Yeah. So I'm wondering about going all the way back to when somebody is on your site, they're, they've hit the buy now button and then they're looking to decide to make a purchase. Um, I like how often do people take advantage of like the risk reducing features? Um, I think you mentioned that just in order to push them over the edge, you can offer doing things like uh, offering a return or offering a warranty. Um, does this cost like a significant amount of like money or time when people do take advantage of these? So let me first make sure I understand. When you say take advantage of this, Mm -hmm. Do you just mean people are using this feature or are you talking about bad actors that are trying to get more without having to pay? Uh, people that are using it. Okay, well, I mean, I think having a good return policy is, it's going to incur a bit more expense if people are actually using it and there something went wrong with their product. But mm -hmm. the added expense is going to be really small in comparison to the added revenue that comes from more people trying the trying your products out. So it's mm -hmm. one of those things that it is, it is a cost of doing business, but it nets out to be, um, you know, overall a gain. But this, again, this is something that you, as you, if you deploy a tactic like this, you're going to want to track, um, track those metrics. Gotcha. Um, well, yeah, thank you. It looks like nobody else had any questions and, um, yeah, that, I was just really curious about that because um, I've, I've heard about, well, you know, and then taking advantage in the other sense as well. I've heard people sometimes do that, but I, I don't think that's too big of an issue. Um, and then I've also heard about people deciding not to offer those if um, the product becomes like is cheap enough, like it's not worth offering them. Um, mm -hmm. 
And so, yeah, I mean, cause uh, at, at a certain point there's going to be uh, products which are priced uh, lower and to just offer free returns on something that where the shipping outweighs the costs of the products. It's, it's just not, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Um, but yeah, awesome. Thank you so much for coming and uh, giving this presentation. Um, and thank you everybody for attending. You know, I, we're going to be putting this presentation around online as well. And um, yeah, you, you can look out for it there on our page. Um, you mentioned where people can go to find you. And so um, I, I was wondering, do you have any like closing remarks? Um, no, I mean, I think the main point is just that you just have to constantly be testing. And I think everything about running e-commerce is just testing things on a daily basis. So always be testing. Awesome. Well, yeah, thank you again, Paulo. And um, yeah, everybody, please, we, we have a couple more events coming up today. And if you're interested, I strongly encourage you to go check them out on the MSUEA site. Um, yeah, awesome. Uh, with that, I think this is going to conclude this meeting. Thank you so much for uh, for Great. Thanks for having me.